All right. Well, thank you for coming out on a beautiful day. I've heard that the distinguished professors are meeting, so hopefully this means I have an easier crowd. But uh, I don't know what that means. But we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, We're dumber. A dumber crowd. A dumber crowd. Okay. Well, attaining the post of distinguished professor is a sort of a career milestone, I presume, uh, not being one. And um, I guess that does fit into somehow this uh, conversation that I'll hopefully have. And uh, you know, uh, if there are any clarifying questions, please jump in as I go along. I tend to be fairly informal in that way, but we'll save any substantive remarks until the Q&A, which should be plenty of time for. So uh, start off with this sort of meant to be provocative question, is political careerism always a bad thing? Uh, that supposes that most of us think that careerist politicians are somehow normatively bad in a way. Uh, I think there's ample context to support that, especially in the US. Uh, we're going out into the, uh, uh, driving home yesterday, I saw these signs fire Graham along the road. So that, that sort of makes an assumption about the fact that he's been there too long and it's time for the voters to get rid of him. Um, so I wanted to give you not, not really a normative discussion about whether or not it's good to be a careerist politician, but some of the empirical evidence about what careerism is good for in terms of the productivity of legislators, particularly in Europe, but I'll, I'll start off with some American examples just to, uh, to phase us in a little bit. So just the, the basic outline for where we're headed, give you some sort of a roadmap. Uh, how is it that we study careers in political science? I'm not the only one who looks at different careers, but most of us are not political scientists in this room, so what is the usual approach to this sort of topic? Uh, give you a bit of my, my own research puzzle, which is what determines careerism among some politicians, particularly in uh, the European context of the European Union level. Um, what are some consequences of uh, turnover, volatility, a lack of careerism at the European level? Um, give you some theoretical uh, suggestions as to how that might go and some results as well, and uh, then hopefully have some sort of discussion or questions about that afterwards. So that's kind of where we're headed. Now, I told you that I would give you some background context on American political careers. Um, if you think about the way that politicians advance through their lives, um, they're essentially climbing a fairly well laid out um, hierarchy uh, of possible jobs in the US context, right? You know, at the very local level that you can run for city council, you can run for mayor. Um, above that somehow is state legislature. Um, state governorships, positions, um, Congress we know to be a higher job or somehow more prestigious or powerful than state jobs usually, maybe not governor, but uh, still fits in neatly to this ladder. And uh, then of course cabinet positions all the way up to the presidency. So you know, it looks kind of like a Christmas tree, I didn't mean for it to, but it's, it should be a fairly strict hierarchy of positions. And we know that uh, folks climb up the ladder as opposed to going up, down, or sideways usually. And if we just take some evidence from uh, three most recent presidents, we can see some pretty, pretty strong similarities between their personal and professional backgrounds. Uh, two out of three were trained attorneys. Uh, of course, Clinton and Obama have JDs and were practicing lawyers at some point. Uh, all three of them started off at lower level office. Uh, Clinton uh, started off as a campaign volunteer and then ran unsuccessfully for Congress in Arkansas before becoming the state's attorney general and then governor before becoming the president. Um, Obama, similar background, working at community level, community organizer, heard that brand before, branding of him rather. Uh, then served in the Illinois State Senate, US Senate, presidency, and Bush even, uh, kind of a lateral entry because he was working in the oil sector, but uh, did begin work um, with an unsuccessful run for Congress, followed by working on his father's presidential campaign, then holding the Texas governorship before the presidency. So, you know, all three of these uh, gentlemen, uh, fairly similar backgrounds. We, we know that in the US, most careers tend to advance upon previous level experience, and that level is lower. In other words, we know that you know, if you're going to run for senator, you probably ought to have been something training you for that position at the local or the state level ahead of time. Natural candidates do come from below, and climbing usually only happens in one direction, which is to say going up the career ladder. Um, anything short of that requires some additional explanation. When Elliot Spitzer runs for local New York office this past fall after being 
um, and governorship ahead of time, you have, to, you have to start explaining how these sorts of things happen. Of course, it had to do with his personal scandals, but it's unusual, it's remarkable that he was no longer simply sort of trying to climb the ladder. Uh, and most of the individual, most of the career decisions made by politicians in the U.S. are heavily individualized. It's, it's their own personal ambition. I think I'm going to run for this. I think I'm going to put my neck out there. I am going to decide to file to run for Congress or Senate or whatever. Now, if we contrast that, oh, no, before we contrast that, just some of the, uh, the consequences of this type of a career model that we see in the US. Well, if we take a look at Congress, which is uh, probably the pinnacle of most careers, I put presidency at the top, but not a lot of people are gonna become president, and not a lot of people expect they will become president, but a lot of politicians would like to see themselves end up in Congress. However, Congress as a job is highly unavailable. Um, after the 2012 Congress elections, 91% um, of all sitting congressmen were reelected. That's not very much turnover. That's very little wiggle room for outgoing congressmen overall. Right? In fact, actually, uh, one study from the mid-90s, this is the Maltzman et al. article, uh, looks at leading causes of turnover in the U.S. Congress, and among the top three is death. <laughs> That's, they literally, uh, the, there's a really, the, the writing is hysterical in this article. You should take a look at it if you have a chance or a reason to, but the, the section title is something like leaving with their feet first or something. But uh, they, essentially, there's not much turnover happening at the U.S. Congress level. These are highly career-oriented politicians. Um, and this is, of course, where we get these sort of normative questions about, is it a good thing that uh, most politicians sort of act as careerist, and as well as some empirical consequences for this as well. So keep that in the back of your minds as the system that we've sort of grown up in mostly here, and contrast that then with what's going on in the European Union. And this is a much more messy, disorganized model of potential careers that one might hold in politics within EU member states. Right, so that's 28 countries now, basically all major countries in Europe except for Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, and some uh, former communist countries in the East, although very not many of them anymore either. So most countries in Europe kind of fit under this model. <laughs> at the one hand, you can work at the EU level. You can work for the EU and the Commission and the European Parliament, which I'll talk more about in a minute, um, and the Council um, and the Court of Justice. These are all sort of uh, positions that are floating around at the continent system-wide level, but uh, there's, there's a reason I made it a cloud, because it's a bit nebulous whether this is a better thing than working in national politics, or maybe less prestigious, or less powerful. It's a bit unclear as to where this fits on a hierarchy. Um, and even within different national systems, and I give you just my ideas of how national hierarchies might work in Germany, France, and Poland, which are just three countries that are, are large and I know well, uh, some big differences. If you're a politician in Germany, you might want to become chancellor, or you might want to become a member of the Bundestag, the German parliament, or you might want to work in local government. France doesn't even have substantial local government to speak of. Uh, very little power at the local level, so probably the only game is going to be in national politics for you. Uh, maybe you could be president, but France also has a prime minister, so do you want your life to be in the cabinet, or do you want it to be in the executive's office of the presidency? Lots of different decisions to make. Right? not a very clean cut, clear hierarchy in terms of its organization and in terms of the differences between all of these different countries that all fit under the cloud of the EU or the umbrella of the EU. Okay. Um, if we take a look at some notable politicians, trying to find something equivalent to the three most recent presidents, when Cherry picked a couple of recent uh, major leaders in Europe, we see that their day jobs, their backgrounds are extremely different from one another, in fact. Um, all three of these were uh, national leaders from center-right, conservative, or Christian Democratic parties, and yet they have very different training. Angela Merkel, currently the Chancellor of Germany, has been for going on 10 years now, in her third term. Actually, has a PhD in chemistry. She's not a trained lawyer. Um, the reason for that is that she came from the eastern part of Germany, and it was considered politically safe to work in the hard sciences because you were not sort of under the radar of the Socialist Party that was worried about you being a, a good communist, essentially. But, uh, but you know, that's her training, and she didn't move into politics until after German reunification in the 90s. She did serve as an MP, a member of parliament of the Bundestag, before becoming a party leader, and then the chancellor, which is the equivalent of the prime minister. Um, Nicolas Sarkozy, uh, most recently concluded presidency of France, uh, started off as a lawyer, worked his way up, 
um, from local um, city mayor of Noyi sur Seine, his sort of uh, Parisian suburb, some regional councils that I said are not very, part of, uh, not very powerful, actually ran and was seated in the European Parliament, but never actually served in the European Parliament. Uh, he gave up his job within two days. Um, to the next person on the list, he actually was just doing it for publicity because he would then, then go on to work in national politics instead. And then this last gentleman, Jerzy Buzek, is a former prime minister of Poland. Um, he actually is a trained engineer, worked in the Solidarity Movement, uh, served, served as uh, both a Polish uh, prime minister and member of parliament before actually being the president of the European Parliament most recently. So, uh, you know, lots of differences in their backgrounds. So, you know, if I was going to contrast this with what I just showed you about the Americans, I would say that uh, typical career paths of Europeans vary widely between countries and even within countries. Um, it's unclear to me and to most people what institutions are actually higher or lower on the hierarchy. Uh, there's not just this idea of moving straight up into working for the EU. Not all politicians would agree that EU office is more desirable, more prestigious, more powerful than their national offices. Right? So career paths can be sort of circuitous, move up, down, all around. Um, and uh, one other thing to mention, and this will get into my analysis and my theory a little bit, um, is that it's not an individually driven system as much in the EU. Uh, political parties have a main role and determining what candidates will run for which offices. Um, so you know, individual incentive, individual ambition is not necessarily listened to by political parties. Parties are a lot stronger across all European countries. Right? So uh, that might have something to do with why these differences are so great between the US and Europe. Now, you know, why does this matter? Why care about um, such a different system than our own? Well, if we take a look at the European Parliament, which is where we'll stay for the rest of the talk, but the European Parliament is the main legislative branch of the EU. This is the only branch of the European Union that is directly elected by all citizens across EU member states. So every five years, they're elected to Parliament. Uh, turnover is above 50%. In other words, turnover of the US Parliament, or the US Congress, excuse me, from one term to the next, is less than 10%. Right? Less than, fewer than 10% of the people leave, and the third reason for that is dying. Uh, European Parliament, more than half don't show up for the next term. Don't even try to show up for the next term. Uh, and political scientists have made some hay on this for the past 30 years saying, well, it's just an unimportant legislature. Um, it's a second order election. In other words, it's not as important as national politics. People are not as interested in it. Voters don't care as much. It's not as powerful. Um, and so they've gone on to sort of characterize anyone who might want to work in European politics as either being um, in kindergarten, hospital, or retirement home. In other words, training, but not a big name yet, um, somehow got in trouble at the national level and had to be sort of swept away for a while, um, or just an old guy. In, in German, there is a common phrase, hast du einen Opa schickt ihn nach Europa. Do you have a grandfather? If so, send him to Europe. Uh, right, so now, you know, this is because people consider it to be sort of a useless legislature. Now, I'll, I'll make an argument that that's not true, probably was never true, and is certainly no longer true in terms of its legislative power, and that countries that overlook the importance of building careers in this institution essentially do so at their own peril. So, looking within the European Parliament, I sort of uh, started off with this question a couple of years ago, and I've been trying to sort of sort out what might be uses of the European Parliament for someone's political career. Um, and I've essentially come up with sort of three ideal type paths that I, I think that a lot of European politicians tend to follow when they go to work for the EU. When, when, was, it, when was this established? Uh, the European Par okay, yeah. So uh, the European Parliament was established um, in the 1950s as a part of the original uh, European coal and steel community, which then became the EU. Um, it's only been elected since the 70s, so for my own analysis, I'm only looking at 1979 to current, because that's the only time it's been. Used to be that they were just nominated from national parliaments. Um, and so they, they were sort of avocational as opposed to professional politicians. But what I'm looking at is only since they've been directly elected since the 70s, uh, doing what it is that they do. And I'll tell you more about their powers in a minute. But, um, but essentially, if you think about what people within the EP might do, European what MEPs, I'll call them, members of the European Parliament, might do for their careers. Some of them were interested mostly in national office. These are the retirement folk, the folks who did 
serve a long, glorious career in national political life, climbed whatever ladder they were interested in climbing, and got put up in Europe as sort of a, a plum retirement job, a cushy last five years of employment. That did exist. It does still exist to some extent. Um, the German model, that German saying, is not entirely wrong, uh, but not as much anymore. Uh, second of all, with some evidence of folks who tried to make their name in the European Parliament before making a run at a national office, so kind of going up and then down. Um, that's the sort of Sarkozy model of getting elected to the European Parliament, because it's easy to. You make your name that way, and then you actually go for what you want, which is to say national politics. Um, and then, increasingly, we see more politicians in this third column that uh, essentially only want to work at the EU level. Um, and build entire careers at the continental level or do things to get themselves to this higher EU level throughout their entire careers. So what I'm essentially trying to figure out in most of this project is, is who are the people that end up in this column and has there been much of a shift towards this column? Where is it? Where is the European Parliament? No, Where is it seated? Yeah. Oh, uh, it's a funny question. Uh, it's seated in three different places. Uh, they have a formal meeting place in Strasbourg, France, that they built this nice big building for there on the top. This inside picture, though, actually is in their Brussels office. They have a full replicate parliament in Brussels. Um, and then their HR staff works in Luxembourg. So they have, they're a traveling parliament, which makes them, once again, this contributes to their, uh, the confusion as to how important it is. Yeah, so the way the calendar works is they, uh, there are some weeks that are done in Brussels, some weeks that are done in Strasbourg, some weeks that are done at home, and there's a bit of moving and shaking. But it is true that the main offices are mostly in Brussels, where most EU offices are. That's why the, the title of the book is All Roads Lead Through Brussels. So, so uh, what exactly am I trying to do in this full project? And then I'll give you some evidence from the last two parts. Uh, first of all, interested in this question of what promotes re-election seeking to this one legislature over time. Um, a lot of that has to do with the increase in the powers of the EP, making it more of an important legislature over time, makes it more of a desirable place to work, cements its position on the hierarchy as an important job to have. Uh, what is less explored and less intuitive is how different countries might treat the same institution differently. 28 different countries, 28 different national political spheres, 28 different career paths of politicians and expected best, expected best practices of how they might behave. Um, so why is it that some countries think this is a great place to go work and others don't? Um, and I answer that by looking at how their political parties are organized in response to the way that the countries are organized. And I'll tell you more about that in a second. Um, and then thirdly, uh, why does it matter? And this is where um, some of the really hard-hitting empirics come from which suggests that those politicians who do build a career in the European Parliament have almost all of the power in its decision making. Um, and so if you're a party responsible for putting them in this job, you're going to have a disproportionate chance of affecting policy change if you put in career politicians. So uh, what does the EP do? Why does this matter? I said that their powers have grown. Well. Uh, the European Parliament, along with the European Union in general, now has complete control over some categories of political life, mostly pertaining to border, border customs issues, as well as uh, most competition and business policy, of course, uh, financial sector with the Eurozone. Uh, a majority of EU members are on the Euro. All of them still have to play by the same financial rules, even if they're not, though, including the UK. Um, commercial regulation, fisheries projects, international treaties. Uh, most of the EU's decision making, including legislation passed by the European Parliament, falls more into this middle category, agricultural policy, economic programs, social programs, transportation, uh, freedom and justice, defense, that sort of thing. Um, and then some roles in which they don't have much power at all. But essentially, you know, this is, a, this is an area of political life that for those who might have said this is a second order legislature that doesn't matter, it's simply not true. 80% um, of all legislation passed at the national level originated in the European Parliament before it. So this is certainly something that people should be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, environmental policy, I put it on that, actually kind of is more towards the complete power. Uh, the European Union in, in the, on the whole has a great deal of environmental policy, mostly doing 
mostly owing to the fact that they regulate all competition and business practices. So EU uh, environmental standards that would come from something like the EPA in the US are more likely to come from the EU level than the national level in Europe. Unless it's a country that's particularly eco-friendly and wants to go above and beyond what the EU would like to have. So, what might lead some countries to treat their politicians differently and to have them treat this European office differently? Well, my big uh, hypothetical difference here that I'll tease out the data for more in a second is, has to do with the way that the countries are organized at the national level. Uh, specifically, I think that federal countries are used to dealing with more levels of political life. Just like in the US, we're already used to this idea of states existing and being nest nested within a national level of politics, and you can work in state issues, or you can work in national issues, or you can work at local issues. And so for those countries in the EU that are organized in the same way as federal countries, we would expect um, their political parties to be used to identifying what politicians work best where, and sort of matching up political interests, professional interests, with uh, actual power in those institutions. Um, and those countries that are the opposite, that are unitary, where all politics is really only done at the central national level and there's no real local government and no real strong uh, regional government. Uh, the, the archetype here is sort of France, but there are lots of countries in Europe that are like this. Uh, you know, political parties don't have an incentive to place their candidates across multiple levels. They only want to recruit the best, brightest, most interesting politicians and put them into national government. They've sort of acted as funnels for recruiting from all sorts of different levels and putting them into national parliament. So they're not necessarily gonna know what to do with the European Parliament, with this new level of government. Just some basic anecdotal evidence or descriptive data that I've collected on this and I'll, I'll get more into the statistical models later, but uh, what this is showing us is all of the different members of the European Parliament from France beginning in 1979 up until the end of the most recently completed wave of the parliament in 2009. Interestingly enough, they're having re-election in May of this year. Um, so we're gearing up for that campaign, but that wave is not done yet of parliament. Uh, this blue line, which is the third line here, is the percentage of French MEPs that were seating in, or seated, in, seated in parliament and wanted to seek re-election to parliament at the end of that wave. So only about 40, 50% of all French members of European Parliament ran for re-election even as far back as the 70s and still today. Right? So it's pretty low re-election seeking levels compared to that 90% in the US, 95% for seeking re-election probably. Compare that to a federal country like Germany, same blue line, same data, 60% all the way up to nearly 80% of German members of the European Parliament running for re-election not even getting reelected, just running for reelection here, right? And, and relative, these other colored lines are different things they might do instead, like seek national office. Um, very few Germans jump the boat from European level back to national level. Relatively more French people do. Why does this all matter? I mean, it's interesting for someone like me who uh, uh, you know, wants to study differences in country levels, but it must mean something in terms of policy outcomes. Well, the European Parliament is one of the world's largest legislatures, keep in mind how big of a place this is. There are more than 800 members elected at any given time. Right? They're actually trimming down that number somewhat in the next term, but it's a big place to work. Um, and because of that, most of the actual policies that are passed are passed first at the committee level before being voted on in plenary. In fact, actually, I mean, if you're thinking about comparative legislatures, the European Parliament works almost exactly like the US Congress does in a number of ways. There's a committee process and then there's a floor vote. Um, which is unusual for a lot of other European legislatures, but for us it looks pretty familiar. However, the person in charge of guiding a legislative proposal through the committee process, hammering out an agreement, passing it to the committee level, bringing it to for a floor vote, um, that office is different in Europe, and that's called a rapporteur, a French word for reporter. Um, you know, basically, if you're the rapporteur, you're given a legislative dossier, a legislative proposal, and you're the guy or the girl in charge of that for the entirety of its life within the European Parliament. So if you want to be a well-known legislator in this large sea of more than 800 co-workers, your goal is going to be to serve as the rapporteur. 
And your party's goal is going to be to get you to serve as the rapporteur because whatever you say on that legislative proposal probably is going to fly for the parliament on the whole because there's so many things going on that not every legislator has time to read every bill. Who actually gets to become this valued rapporteur? Well, political parties get to actually bid on them. Um, they have a certain number of points based on their size in the parliament at the start of each term, and they actually sort of bid on them like an auction within each committee. So if the, uh, you know, if the, if the bill on the new highway gets referred to the transport committee, uh, and uh, there is a plurality of conservatives on the transport committee, they will have more points than the, than the lefty group, or than the Greens, or than the socialists, or whoever. Um, and based on those points, their leader can pay points in exchange for getting that report. So there's some strategy involved in which points, which reports you're actually going to bid on. But once the party wins the report, it's kind of up to them who gets to serve as rapporteur. So that's an internal decision. Um, however, we know from a lot of political science work done before it that whatever the rapporteur comes up with as the legislative proposal for that committee is almost always going to pass committee and floor vote. So it's a very powerful office to, to get. What we haven't looked much into before, and one thing that I do look into, is how this turnover, how this lack of re-election seeking um, might predispose certain countries from performing less well in the rapporteur allocation process. So this is just matching up that descriptive data from a couple slides previous with how many reports they have. Well, the the, uh, the solid line, solid yellow line, looks at Germany, and the solid blue line looks at France, and what percentage of their MEPs were already in their role previously. So in other words, no one was a senior member of the European Parliament during its first wave, but after that, more than 60% of all German MEPs had been there before, only 35% of French had been there before. Those numbers maintain pretty consistently, and then comparing that to the average number of reports that Germans and French had during the wave. Right? So Germans, on average, had almost four reports assigned to them per person. French had basically half that number. So looking at that connection between lack of being able to run for re-election to this office and lack of ability of making changes once you're there. Okay, so one thing important to know about the European Parliament, and I, I didn't mention this directly, uh, they're organized into political parties based on their ideologies. They're not actually, rep they're representing home constituencies, but you know, our, our congressman is supposed to be sort of representing, well, this doesn't quite work as well in the US, but you know, Tim Rice is supposed to be representing the Republican Party as opposed to just Florence, right, in a way. So they're, they're representing their party, not their nation, or not their home constituency. But for the rapporteur, it matters for the party, of course, to get the assignment. So, because they do have so much control, even if they're not in the majority of the legislature, what they say will hold. Yeah, John. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that specifically. I mean, the Greens, on the whole, are about the fourth largest group out of seven in the parliament. Uh, there are a lot of German Greens. Um, but the thing is that, first of all, you have to assign committees based on the relative strengths of the party groups. So you have to have, it probably wouldn't have been overrepresented because in each committee there should have been an even percentage of Greens, basically, across all the committees. Yeah. So but these are, this is still just descriptive data, right? This is not regression analysis yet. So anyway, uh, to sum all of that theory up and some of the descriptions that I've given you, I'll, I'll sort of go through tests that I took for two hypotheses, uh, one of which is that MEPs from more federalized, decentralized countries will be more likely to stay at the European Parliament level than those that are from unitary countries, whose parties are going to funnel them back into national office or otherwise direct them away from being in the EU. Um, and then along with this, why does this matter question, MEPs that have been there longer, that have more experience, more seniority, are more likely to get more reports, be a rapporteur more often. Also looked at their levels of personal education and if there's some sort of relationship between career background and that kind of thing. But get more into that later. <laughs>
uh, you know, this is the point when I start putting this into uh, more social scientific models and eventually give you some stats. Um, but I'll, I'll, if, you, if you have any questions about the statistics, we can talk about that as well, but I'll try to gloss over that a little bit just so eyes don't glaze over. Um, but essentially looking at two different dependent variables. One is looking at the likelihood of an M M MEP, a member of the European Parliament, seeking re-election based on um, what sort of federal or local uh, legislative background they come from. Um, also things that might matter that I can control for in a multi-regression analysis, uh, their seniority, uh, whether or not they served as leader on a committee. So if you're, if you're a leader in the parliament, you're probably more likely to seek re-election because you've invested yourself professionally in that. Um, control for things like whether or not they didn't make it through the whole wave of parliament, they dropped out early, that's obviously going to negatively bias them from running again, especially if they died. If they died, they're not going to run again. Um, we have to control for that. Uh, their age, their gender, uh, and then some specific uh, effects related to their partisanship, ideology, extremism, uh, the timing, because this is all uh, data that extends from the 70s up till today. Um, for the other models I'm looking at, this is for that second hypothesis, uh, you know, what do these things matter in terms of their number of rapporteurships they hold in any given wave of parliament? Uh, it might have something to do with their education, it might have something to do with their seniority, and then all of these other controls as well. So I'll give you some of the uh, ideas of what I found with that. Just to tell you what kind of data I'm testing, this is stuff that I uh, drew up mostly for my dissertation, but it's essentially a data set with um, observations on all 4,000 members of the European Parliament that ever served um, since 1979 up till 2009, where they could have run for re-election. Um, I'm working on coding this right now for um, the current running uh, campaigns, but because actually the filing date's not quite there yet, I don't know exactly how many of them are going to be running for re-election in May. Um, so I, I couldn't extend it beyond 2009 yet, but you know, this is fully comprehensive data. Um, a lot of it involved many months of archive digging um, around various libraries in Europe, as well as stuff that's online. Um, and then also to, to make sure that I'm not just doing quantitative work without qualitative background. Um, I, I did interview about 50 current and former members of the European Parliament in their offices in Brussels, Paris, Luxembourg, Warsaw, and Berlin over the course of a couple years. So this is stuff that went into it. Uh, methodology, uh, I'll, I'll skip that for now, but um, feel free to ask me questions about the models. Uh, what do I actually find substantively? Uh, for this, looking at this effect of federalism on the decision to seek re-election, uh, I do find that countries that are federal tend to have MEPs that seek re-election more. In other words, the volatility is lower. So there's a negative effect of um, federalism on uh, volatility. MEPs be behave the way that they should. Um, this is done with a couple different indicators. Um, and the uh, more federal a country is, the more likely they are to seek re-election to the European Parliament instead of jumping ship to a national parliament. So just some basic um, evidence that 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 does match the hypothesis, essentially. And here's some predicted probabilities that I ran just for one of these different measures from one of the models. But essentially, just to give you an idea of how substantively important this is, um, countries that are uh, unitary, in other words, highly centralized, about 16% of their MEPs across all waves ran for national election. Countries that were most federal, only about 12% ran for national election. That doesn't sound like a whole lot, but once you've controlled it for 30, 40 different dummy variables and different controls, that's a, that's a pretty meaningful, significant relationship as far as I'm concerned. Uh, reports, this is a little bit easier to understand. Uh, the number of terms that an MEP most ha had served prior to their current you know, year in parliament is going to predict all things equal a lot more work. Right? So it's a pretty monotonic relationship, actually. More time you spend in Brussels or in Strasbourg, uh, the more likely you were to get picked to be this rapporteur. Um, all things equal, right? Lots of controls played into this as well. Right? And this is actually from marginal effects, not predicted probabilities for this one. Um, looking at this last one, uh, this is thinking about their educational background. I just thought this was kind of interesting, but as MEPs, I coded their highest degree, what they'd earned, whether it was a technical degree, a bachelor's, a high school, a uh, post-grad, um, and found actually that you know, essentially, the more educated MEPs were, the more 
uh, work they got as well. Uh, why is this? The European Parliament works on a lot of specialized issues, and so knowing to be an expert in your field is going to give you a lo higher likelihood of being picked to work on a specific legislative proposal. Um, this, this, these two different lines are just, uh, essentially this was earlier in the time period and this was later in the time period. So that, that difference is even more meaningful today than it used to be. Uh, it's the first, the, the serving re-election is controlled for with all of these variables and the other, the uh, rapporteur's model is controlling for all of these other variables here. So they're, they're mostly the same variables, the, the difference is the dependent variable more than the independent variables. Yeah. Come back to that in a bit if you'd like. So. Uh, just to conclude, and then do you want to open it up into um, a little bit of Q&A? It does seem like there are pretty systematic differences that exist between um, political parties and the way that they handle nominations for European elections. Um, some parties still are in the mindset the European Union is useless to work in, and others have kind of gotten on board with how this might be a useful office to nominate their candidates for. Um, that seems to co-vary pretty strongly with the type of political organization found at the national level. So you know, political parties that are used to working at multiple levels are kind of okay with adding on another level of the EU, um, whereas unitary countries are a little bit more confused as to what to do with this new parliament. Um, so volatility and turnover are heavily impacted by that. Um, and this all matters for the amount of work that gets done. So like I said, if you're a German who knows that they can stay as long as they want to and has served six terms already, you're going to have the lion's share of the work compared to French politicians who, and I, I've interviewed a number of French politicians uh, who have said very clearly they would love to seek re-election, but their party will yank them out in the next election. Um, they have no choice over the matter, right? And they're not getting work because they haven't been there long enough to get their feet wet in the legislative system, right? So this stuff matters for the distribution of power nationally as well as ideologically. So that's, those are the main points. I know it's, a, it's hard to present a, a book and an article and a dissertation and then some in 40 minutes, but uh, that's kind of what I'm working on, and I'm happy to hear uh, your questions and complaints. <laughs>